I'm Brian Seth Hurst in Los Angeles. And I'm Alison Norrington in London, and welcome to the Story Hour. Please subscribe, like, and if you want to know when the next episode is, and we've got 30 of them now, we're just ending season one, click that bell. The Story Hour sits at the intersection of storytelling and technology. We bring you the story behind the stories, how it's written, how it's produced, how it's distributed, and even the personal stories behind the storytellers themselves. We talk with the master writers, producers, directors, authors, and technologists covering it all from film and television to literature, virtual and augmented reality and more, as well as the innovations in production, technology, and distribution that are changing the how of storytelling. Our guest today is CEO of Helium. That is H-E-A-L-I-U-M, a virtual and augmented reality tool for human performance that's powered by the user's own brain waves and heart rate. After 20 years as a TV reporter covering trauma, the media diet of reporting today's headlines ultimately made our guest sick. She developed helium for herself as well as the 41 million others who struggle daily with anxiety. Our guest is also a former interactive TV news journalist for the NBC, ABC and CBS affiliates in Missouri, a 12-time Mid-America Emmy award-winning TV reporter she has 25 years of experience building unique media franchises and decades reporting about the world's negativity and trauma in Sri Lanka, Zambia, Guatemala, Indonesia, and Congo. Please welcome Sarah Hill. Hello, Sarah Hill. Hello. It's great to be with you, you story nerds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am so glad, you know, I, I didn't tell Allison this, but you know, the first time I met you, we like connected it was like instant and we connected on the level of storytellers and this was at the very beginning of vr we're talking back <laughs> this makes it at the very beginning of vr but it was only six years ago when i stopped to think about it but you started out as a storyteller you started out as a reporter you had all that in your background and when you first used vr because i want to get us from point a to b when you first used vr you were using virtual reality for storytelling. Can you talk a little bit about that and what attracted you to it to begin with? And then we'll talk about how you got to where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. So started out uh, creating experiences for brands. Uh, we had the luck to have some large brands send us all over, all over the world, the Amazon, uh, Congo, and um, uh, Zambia to capture immer immersive media. And at the time we were giving a group of aging veterans virtual tours to see their memorials in Washington, DC. And it was a totally new uh, medium as, as Brian described. And it was disconcerting for a storyteller because that frame that we had to have control over the frame for decades as storytellers, suddenly there was no frame and the viewer had that control. So it was a very different way to tell stories that I, I struggled with at first, but eventually we learned how to do it through this brand storytelling and then started giving tours to aging vets so they can see their memorials, which ultimately is a long story, but it led us to helium. Well, I can, I can remember watching the reactions of the vets as they got to do the tour because this was the honor flight, right? And yeah, so, absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about honor flight? Because I'm, I'm just, it's your background as a storyteller and you're recognizing people's reactions to the stories that you were telling that I think actually led you down the technology path that you're on. So can you talk a little bit about Honor Flight? Yeah, absolutely. And these ultimately are, are therapeutic stories. So Honor Flight is a nonprofit organization. They have more than 130 hubs all around the nation. And about a decade ago, I helped form, along with um, some great volunteers, the Honor Flight Hub here in Central Missouri. I was a television news reporter and I had been going on covering them, doing stories about the Honor Flight Network. We went on a, about a dozen flights in, in one year. And when you're surrounded by those amazing stories of, of those World War II veterans, uh, you know, it, went, it gave us the impetus to want to form a hub in Central Missouri. So got together a, a great group of, of volunteers and to make a long story short, that hub continues today in central Missouri. They've flown thousands of, of, of vets to see their memorials, but I would get calls from some of these veterans families saying, 
uh, you know, uh, my husband can't go. He's on too much oxygen. He has a heart condition and his doctor says that he, he physically can't, he's too, too weak to travel. And so we started, you know, tech technologists, what do we have in our own skills to be able to allow him to feel like he's at the memorial, even though other, uh, they're not physically able to travel. We had been using Google Glass and, and um, I, I would go to the memorials in Washington, D.C. and live stream from my face and they would join on laptops and VA homes. And we did that for about um, two years and we would be the arms and the legs of, of the veteran walking through the memorial and they would tell us what they wanted to see. But obviously that does not scale. You have to have physical volunteers and the, about the same time, virtual reality was coming into existence, and we thought, aha, we can capture it once with a camera, ship the goggles to the veteran, and they can, we don't have to have a live person do it, and they can be at the memorial as if it was in their own living room, uh, not knowing how important those stories that we did, and we did the World War II, Vietnam, Korea, Women's Memorial, and we also shot some on the USS Nimitz out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And now that the pandemic hit, all of those honor flights are grounded. And so, you know, sadly, there are a lot of men and women who will pass this year, having never had the opportunity to, to see their memorial. So um, we are working to get them kits. We just announced a new partnership with T-Mobile uh, today for that and the Honor Flight Network. It's just using story um, uh, to take them to see their memorials. And then it's a long story, but how we formed helium from that, as we noticed, as Brian said, when they were in the goggles, their body would soften. They would take, you know, deep cleansing breaths. They take off the goggles and they say, I like how I felt. Can I watch it again? And journalists, naturally curious person, what is it happening to their physiology? And can we create this media and stories in a way that actually has a therapeutic impact on people or could shift their brain patterns, lower their heart rate, make them feel better. And so I teamed up with my co-founder, who's a neurofeedback uh, specialist. He did a, a brain map on a, a variety of uh, individuals who were using helium and saw that very quickly, this kind of media, more powerful than regular 2D media because inside the goggles or even inside your mobile device, it tricks the brain into thinking that that isn't, I'm just w w watching it through the filter of a fits, fixed rectangle. I'm actually at the waterfall or at the beach. So and now you're based, well, I wanna go back for two seconds. Was there an aha moment for you? What was that aha moment? Yes. So his name was Mr. Smith. He was a, a veteran who we were giving a virtual tour of. And his caretaker told us he's not able to lift his arms above his head. And I have a, have a photo of this. Um, and so in, when he was inside the goggles, halfway through the experience, he had his arms above his head when was reaching out for the people that he saw inside the screen. And his daughter, who was his caretaker, said, I, I, have never, I haven't seen him do that. And a very long time. Uh, um, I'm not sure what he's seeing, but it motivated him some way uh, that, you know, reality uh, hasn't. And um, in a lot of this testing, uh, Dr. Tarrant sent me back a brain map. So I just want to say Jeff Tarrant, right? Mm -hmm. He's a neuroscientist yes. and your partner. He is a neurofeedback specialist, counseling psychologist. He wrote the book on, on neuromeditation. He's based in Eugene, Oregon. But he said, let's just do some EEG testing to see, you know, how are, are these experiences impacting physiology? And what he shared with me um, was my aha moment when he sh the picture of a red fast activity in the brain immediately before helium. And then four minutes after that fast activity had significantly reduced. So um, it was like you had put someone in a warm bath or a walk in the park and they didn't even have to leave their, their living room. So right then, um, and we all, I always knew in the back of my head that media somehow impacted people because it makes us cry. It makes us laugh, you know, all the things but using it as a therapeutic, drugless, non-harmful coping mechanism, that was the aha moment where I realized that 
uh, we needed to turn our ship from a service-based company that was creating experiences for brands uh, and and pivot to a product-based pump company that could create some clinically validated experiences to downshift the nervous system, shift brain patterns, lower heart rate, um, and allow people to self-manage their their stress. That is so beautiful, and it reminds me of there was a video released earlier this year. You definitely saw it of the the ballerina lady, the. And it was amazing, wasn't it? And they played the music to her. And I think she was in a wheelchair or something. And within minutes, she was like her muscle memory was all of the moves and the poses and everything that she'd done as a younger woman, as a ballerina. There's there's something in there that you're unlocking. And it sounds to me like you've tuned in to the capability of that. I mean, I looked at Helium on my phone with the AR version. And my family was watching a football match, a soccer match. And it was crazy. And I thought, oh, God, this is stressing me out. So I went to the waterfall. And then I went, is it Switzerland with the snow scene? And it's mm-hmm. just so lovely, even just on my phone, no headset, to just, like, go around the room. I love that, of course, with AR, the image follows you. And mm-hmm. even in that situation, on my phone, crazy sports on the TV, everyone's shouting, it was beautiful. So even on that kind of low barrier to entry way of using helium, I, yeah, it, you've really got something that I feel post-pandemic is even more important than possibly it had been before. There's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. Uh, mental health emergency, 25% of 18 to 24-year-olds have suicidal ideation. And so we need some drugless, non-harmful coping mechanisms. And yes, augmented reality is, is, is a great tool, far more engaging mm-hmm. than 2D media. And mm-hmm. uh, we're just taking those VR experiences, reducing the barrier to entry and putting them in magic portals in AR that you can walk through a teleport through in your, your living room. And then you're inside another beautiful magical kingdom, a nebula in space. You can float through a brain and see all the different synapses. Mm-hmm. Um, and discover the healing powers that you have inside yourself if you connect a wearable. But using the EEG, sorry, Brian, just one thing, using the EEG, like, and the, the mapping that you've done, like, you've you've overlaid the storytelling onto, like, a natural kind of rhythm in terms of how we respond and react, which kind of takes things to another level. Because I've said to Brian before, I like putting the headset on and just going into the cinema and sitting into an, in an empty cinema. And I look around at all the red velvet chairs and there's no one in there but me. That alone, I love it, especially when things are stressful. I don't even watch anything. But you've kind of taken that and like turned up all the dials on it, that there's actually a crafted story and a crafted experience. It's fantastic. Well, we are still learning, um, telling stories with uh, your brain patterns and heart rate attached um, presented unique challenges that we had to discover how how you did you did that and ultimately it's not just lean back experiences these are training experiences of sorts that you are learning to self regulate and you know that's the issue right now is people can't self regulate their brain if they could we might not have as much uh, you know medication subscriptions or um, therapists. Now, helium is not a replacement for psychotropic medication. It's not a replacement for counseling, which is one of the best things that you can do for yourselves. But um, you know, allowing the user to learn to heal themselves and to self-regulate their brain patterns is something that even people as an adult have not learned. Yeah, we don't um, know how to do that. You said to me mm-hmm. before, we're in the stress Olympics and nobody's trained, right? We don't know how to do that. We're not taught that at school. Our parents don't know how to teach it to us. Like it's a lack of education, not a lack of, you know, desire or essential kind of things that we should do. We just don't know how to do it. I, I yeah. think part of it is the interpretation that you're not, you know, if you're meditating or you're, even just sitting still, that stillness is non-productive. And so <laughs> physical exercise, that's productive. You'll have evidence. But emotional exercise, even even to the point of developing emotional intelligence through helium, because you, you it does develop emotional intelligence, it develops social intelligence. But I think that, I think we're, I think your timing is kind of perfect because... Mm-hmm. 
when you look, okay, so I attended Vivecom this morning, the keynote speech. Yeah. And when they were talking about Vive for business and they have a, an enterprise storefront, but they talked about all the practical applications. And then they said at the end, we even have uh, free applications for you to manage your stress, for you to decompress. So it's a realization on their part that wellness and there, and you know yourself, Sarah, because you're talking to these people who the heads of wellness are at corporations. <laughs> like now their entire departments de de dedicated to the wellness of the well being of the people. So you have a cultural revolution taking place for, you know, mutual respect and honoring. But now this is also about honoring the self and honoring what needs to be healed. And what I, I what I love about the brilliance of this is that it did it totally came out of your storytelling experience. But it also came out of your story worlding experience. So mm -hmm what you did for veterans, all of the stories that you've told in news, you just wanted people to be closer to the story. When VR came along, this is just my observation, Sarah, of having known you. When VR came along, it's like, okay, now I can take them into the story with me. And then with the veterans being able to see that once they were in that story world, there was a physiological reaction because everybody talked about the empathy response. Everybody talked about, you know, tricking the brain and all that, but there wasn't the kind of evidence except in academia, there wasn't the kind of evidence that you were creating for, you'll excuse me for saying so, a commercial product. One that says, okay, this is based in science, folks. This is what we know. And what I think will be really interesting as you grab data and you go along from your experience is the, um, the just my observation I wanted to ask you about this is, do you think that you will contribute with this to what I think will become the ethical responsibility of storytellers and and virtual reality creators about the effect that their content has on the body. Yeah, that's, that's a great point and such so important for your uh, storytellers who are listening to know that absolutely what they create impacts physiology um, in not just our peer-reviewed research, but tons of peer peer review peer-reviewed research out there about immersive media. And um, the unique uh, implications that that has on the storyteller to ensure that they're not doing something that makes uh, users disoriented or sick or audio that's you know coming from the front, uh, that appears to be coming from the front, but actually comes from the back. Um, and because it is such a powerful immersive medium that uh, those those creators have a very high responsibility to ensure that they do no harm, which is usually a, a mantra in the medical community. But in this VR pseudocals, AR pseudocals, digiceuticals, whatever you want to call them, people are consuming your media as if it's food, and it's absolutely having an, an impact on your body and your mind. And so. Um, I'm just you know, you don't want to make a, food that makes them sick. <laughs> I'm just going to put in a little side plug, if you will. You know, we do a Thursday at noon, every Thursday at noon, we do a clubhouse and we explore different areas. You brought up the physiology of storytelling, which I think is an amazing topic. So Allison, <laughs> let's take a <laughs> note and let's have <laughs> Sarah contribute to a clubhouse. I think, you know, there's always... There has been visceral reaction when you're in the movies and there's there's visceral reaction to really good storytelling, but the but there's a continuum to it. And you're at the end of the continuum where you're immersed, whereas you're no longer at arm's length. So I think what what Allison and I would like to do is we actually have a, an instructional video that's on your website, which is at uh, what is your website? Helium tryhelium.com tryhelium.com i remembered it to find it i just couldn't remember it to say it right now so <laughs> i would like to play that video so that people can know um what it's really about so this could show my own technical limitations but let's give it <laughs> let's give it a shot shall we 
Hi, I'm Sarah Hill, CEO of Helium. Thank you for trying our products. The simplest way to use Helium is without a wearable. These are beautiful nature-based escapes that have the option to be powered by your brain waves and your heart rate in virtual or augmented reality environments. Let's talk about the difference between virtual and augmented reality. Virtual reality includes these goggles that you put on and you're completely taken somewhere else. You don't have the ability to see the real world. All you see are beautiful nature-based escapes inside a computer-generated environment or inside 360-degree video. Augmented reality, on the other hand, you have the ability to see the real world. You're just using your mobile device in order to superimpose holograms across the screen. Gently slow your breathing. If you're using a wearable interaction, here's what you need to know. This is a BrainLink Lite EEG headband. You'll notice on the front of the headband, there are sensors that are capturing your brainwave activity. Inside the Helium app, you have the ability to power the experience either with calm or focus. If you're meeting that certain threshold for a particular brain pattern, the firefly that you see on the screen will go up. So if that waveform is going up, you are meeting the mark. If it's going down, you need to recall more of a calm memory or more of a focus memory in order to try to make that firefly go up. If you see the background go red or the image dims, that's an indication that you're not meeting the mark. So that's how you use Helium, either with a wearable or without a wearable integration. A reminder, you can use our augmented reality products as well by searching Helium AR in your app store. For more information, you can go to tryhelium.com, check out our science section and all of our peer-reviewed journals. A reminder, your thoughts have power to control things, not only in the virtual world, but the real world as well. That is freaking brilliant. Um, all your on-camera experience comes to bear. <laughs> I know. I lived in a box for decades. They let me out for good behavior, and then I actually build something. So, yeah. You know, I don't know if you remember this. Um, I do have a bit of a competitive side. But when I first tried this with you, I actually was trying too hard. And the harder I tried, the worse it got. And so I was actually stressing out. I remember you said, don't, don't try so hard. But I was actually stressing out over not being able to achieve, which was completely the opposite of what the intention was. And it was like, I guess there was a part of me that wanted to know, to show myself that I could do it. So even that realization about stressing out over relaxing, was a lesson and I hadn't even really experienced the program yet. And I think that's like a friend of mine who bought a bracelet with um, gems on it to relax her and it kept coming undone and she got so stressed with it. She threw it across the room and broke it. That's uh, you. Well, that's well you. shortly, yeah, <laughs> shortly after um, we've installed difficulty settings. So everybody's brain patterns are, are different. And so while it gets a baseline, when you come into the app, you can adjust it easy, medium, or hard. And we always encourage people to put it all the way he's easy, which makes it impossible to fail because um, you've never controlled anything with your, your brain patterns before. And so it's incredibly awkward, much like lifting weights when you, you know it was incredibly awkward the first time you used your, that muscle and you're building that muscle memory. So um, you know, the notion that when you come to Helium and you, you're using a wearable that you're going to be relaxed. No, this is training. It's a, a training tool. You are training your mind. And with that training um, comes, you know, uh, d different levels. And uh, the uh, you have to form the ability to recognize what memory you need to recall or what object or sensation you need to focus on and in order to make that firefly go up. I remember you had asked me if I had a pet and you told me to think of, of my dog. And I told you that my dog had passed and you said, this doesn't matter, just think of your dog, you know, think of that. And it, and it worked and it was just lovely. So we are actually, before we all stress out on time, 
We are actually at the end of our first segment. We're going to welcome you back next week when, as we say, we'll all be wearing the same things because this is about sustainability, not using too much laundry detergent one week to the next, you know, stuff like that. And But I want to talk about, we want to talk about the various applications for the future and what you have in store and also the state of the industry, where we are post-pandemic, what we're coming out of, what we can expect from virtual reality, augmented reality, extended reality, and what the opportunities will be there for self-care. So we'll be back with Sarah Hill next week on the Story Hour. And Allison and I hope you will join us then. We'll see you next week. See you then.